It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Philips 346B1C. As usual, this video accompanies a written review, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. As usual for a video review, what you see depends on my camera, it depends on the processing done by my video editing software, it depends on YouTube, and ultimately it depends on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on. So by no means does it accurately represent exactly what the monitor looks like first hand. This monitor is a 34 inch ultra wide monitor, that's 21 by 9 aspect ratio, with a 3440 by 1440 resolution. It has a VA vertical alignment panel, more specifically a Samsung SVA panel. This has a 1500R curve, which is a moderately steep curve, especially for the screen of this size, it certainly is a feature. But what I would say is what you see in the video and what you see in pictures of the monitor, it kind of exaggerates the effect of the curve. It gives this sort of pincushion effect. It looks like it's going in in the middle, out more towards the edges. But when you're actually sitting at the desk using the monitor, that isn't something you observe in, in the same way at all. And I find this curve perfectly natural. It's something which my eyes adapted to and my brain adapted to very quickly. I used the monitor for a few hours and then I pretty much forgot the curve was there. It still sort of draws you into the experience a bit, it makes it a little bit more immersive, but it isn't weird, it isn't unnatural, it isn't uncomfortable. So certainly don't be put off by the idea of the curve if you haven't sat down at a desk and used a curved monitor yourself. In my opinion it really does work quite nicely, especially on ultra-wide monitors like this. The 3440 by 1440 resolution and 34 inch screen size, essentially what you have is the same kind of height as a 27 inch 16 by 9 monitor. The pixel density is the same as a 27 inch 16 by 9 monitor with a 2560 by 1440, that's WQHD resolution. But you basically have extra information at the sides, extra pixels at the sides, but your pixel density doesn't change. It's very much like a 27 inch WQHD monitor. So that's a pixel density which many users are very comfortable with. It gives decent readability, it gives decent clarity, decent detail to suitably high resolution content. This monitor is marketed as a productivity monitor, so it is certainly good for multitasking. That's really what it's aimed at doing, sort of a bit of work, maybe a bit of play on the side, but it's more marketed towards people who like to have a lot of desktop real estate. So I've got Excel open here, I've got my website open here. There's plenty of useful screen space for multitasking. You might even notice that there's quite a lot of white space and that's quite common on websites, not just my website, but just in general. So you might find it's more efficient to actually have this kind of split. You can get various software programs which will help you split the screen into different sort of section so you can have one third with one window, one third with another, one third with another, or two thirds, one third split, which is roughly what I've got here. I don't use that kind of software myself because I'm happy to just sort of resize things myself and use Windows Snap 2 feature or whatever it's called to resize things appropriately. But th there is certainly some software out there if you have a look, which will do this. So with this kind of split, I've got loads of information on Excel, lots of cells, and again, the curved effect, it's not really noticeable in person to the same extent. I would say though, if you are a designer or you need geometric perfection, that's when perhaps considering a flat monitor might make sense. Although I do know some designers do actually quite happily use curved monitors, so it's really a very subjective thing. Don't be put off. Something I quite like doing myself on ultra wide monitors like this, I like to have just a little section of the screen with a web browser window open so I can look at information browse information, decent amount of text still, quite readable. But I like to have most of the monitor filled with the video when I'm watching something like Netflix, it usually is, sometimes YouTube. But what I would say is I don't generally watch myself on YouTube and, and, and browse the internet at the same time. I'm just using this as an example. And with Netflix, it's a bit better because it fills up the screen better. You tend to find that there's a bit of a black border on YouTube unless you've got a smaller window for the video and Netflix tends to fill up the screen better. It also fills up the screen better vertically. So I'm not going to show you that purely because of copyright issues. People are really tight on that these days um, and I don't want to get in trouble for that. So I'm certainly able to show you my own content because I'm the copyright holder of that content. 
Another thing about Netflix, which is really nice, is that there are a number of different plugins you can get, browser extensions, depending on the browser you're using. For Google Chrome, there are certainly some. I think there's one called Ultra Widefy. There are various other ones, but they're basically plugins which will allow you to use the whole screen space. So if you're viewing a video on Netflix, which supports the 21 by 9 aspect ratio, this plugin will allow it to zoom and crop so it gets rid of the black border. You lose a little bit of the video at the top and bottom because of the zooming and cropping, but not a huge amount. And it just fills the screen up and gives you a nice immersive experience. And you can see more about that on an article we've got all about the 3440 by 1440 34 inch experience. There's a link to that in the written review. The written review has a section talking about this in a bit more detail, and that will give you information about the movie experience, but also the gaming experience and the desktop experience. So I will show you some games shortly. The 21 by 9 aspect ratio is really nice for most games, and I'll talk about that when I'm actually in game because it'll make a bit more sense then. Another thing I like to mention quite early on in the reviews is the screen surface. It's something I am particularly sensitive to if the screen surface is too grainy. This screen surface only has a very mild graininess to it. It really is quite smooth overall when you're observing lighter shades. It isn't quite as smooth as the IPS type ultra wides, um, or indeed the IPS ultra wides, but compared to many matte screen surfaces, there isn't the same kind of graininess. It does look pretty smooth, really, so most users are going to find that just fine. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. The monitor has a smart business like look. It has matte black plastic with a brushed texture on the bottom bezel, it has the same texture on the stand base and it's got a turntable mechanism centrally which has a smoother matte texture, same as the stand base. There's also a cable tidy loop in the centre of the stand base. This little thing here to the left of the Philips logo, that's the power and light sensor which is explored in the OSD video. And there are the OSD controls also explored in the OSD video there at the bottom of the monitor. There's also a little power LED which glows white when the monitor's on and flashes white when the monitor is in a low power state. The screen surface is light matte anti-glare. So this offers decent glare handling without imparting too much graininess to the image when you're observing lighter shades. The top and side bezels have a dual stage design. So there's a slim hard plastic outer component as well as a slender panel border. The panel border blends in quite well when the screen switched off, as it is now, but when the screen switched on, you can see that around the image. So it's flush with the rest of the screen. The screen has a 1500R curve, that's a moderately steep curvature, and it is, certainly for an ultra-wide model like this, fairly noticeable, but still natural to use, and I've talked about that already, so I'm not going to go through that again. Suffice to say that in videos like this and in pictures, it tends to exaggerate the curve. It looks like there's a kind of weird pincushion effect going on, it kind of pinches into the middle. But in reality, when you're sitting in front of the screen, that isn't something which you will notice. Of course, it's quite subjective. Some users will adapt the curve more readily than others, but I personally found it really quite easy to adapt to it. And it certainly doesn't look like it does when you're just looking at pictures and videos of the monitor. Stand offers good ergonomic flexibility. You've got height adjustment. So it's fairly low to the desk at the lowest stand height. Exact measurements are given in the written review. And you can also raise it very high up. It's actually a very generous height adjustment. Again, refer to the written review for exact measurements for that. You can also swivel it left and right. I'd mentioned a turntable mechanism in the center of the stand base. Again, a generous range of adjustment there. It actually allows you to swivel it completely around, 180 degrees each way, I guess it is. I'm not going to do that because it'll bash into the wall, but it really does offer a very good amount of flexibility in that respect. You can also tilt the screen backwards. And again, the tilt angle is actually very generous. I'll just show you from the side there. It tilts back quite far. And you can also tilt it forwards a little bit, if you'd like. From the side, the monitor is reasonably slender at the thinnest point and then it bulks out centrally. Again, the written review includes exact measurements for the thinnest point of the monitor. And you've got the robust stand design there at the back, protruding further out. 
There are also some ports on the left side of the monitor. These are USB ports and you've got four USB 3.2 ports plus upstream and you can see one of them is yellow coloured. That offers fast charging for connected devices. At the rear of the monitor you've got matte black plastic throughout but it has a brushed texture on the outside and the smoother texture in the middle. There's also a central Philips logo and it looks quite neat at the back really and that's because most of the ports are tucked away, they're down firing and they're tucked away beneath this little removable cover which you can just snap off. And by snap I mean just take off, it doesn't break it or anything like that, it just comes off quite easily. There's also a Kensington lock slot towards the bottom right there. Something I forgot to mention when I was recording this section of the video, so I'm just awkwardly adding this in afterwards. The stand attaches using a quick release mechanism. It has a proprietary bracket mechanism. And if you use that little switch there, you pull that upwards, you can remove the screen from the included stand and that will reveal 100 by 100 millimeter VESA holes if you want to use an alternative VESA compatible solution. At the bottom of the monitor you can see a speaker there, there's another speaker grill there. These speakers offer reasonable sound output, I believe they are two 5 watt speakers, double check on the written review for the exact wattage and a little bit about how I found the sound output. There's a 0 watt power switch and that will completely cut power off to the monitor so it's not even using a little bit of standby wattage as it would use if you turn it off using the power button, the normal power button, that's that one there. There's an AC power input, so it has an internal power converter. The other side of the stand, you've got the remaining ports, the main ports of the monitor, and that includes an HDMI 2 port and a DisplayPort 1.2a port. They both support adaptive sync. There's a USB-C port, which offers 90 watt power delivery plus DisplayPort Alt mode, so it offers the same capabilities as DisplayPort if you're using that for your video signal the USB-C port, and it also offers data transfer. I'm now going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. As usual, with VA panels like this, I like to start by talking about the Legom Black Levels test. That's legom.nl, the website, which I use quite extensively in my reviews and I really love for things like this. It has something called Black Crush as a VA panel, and this is due to differences in perceived gamma when you're observing shades centrally versus further out on the screen. And this applies from a normal viewing position and it applies even more significantly if you view off angle. But what it means is there's a central region of the screen, the central region of the screen, things appear to have a higher than intended gamma for these dark shades. And that causes these dark shades to appear even darker than they should. So some of these blocks appear a bit more blended than they should. Although on this monitor, I have to say the black crush is really very slight. I'm not saying it doesn't exist or it's something that nobody's gonna find slightly annoying. I know some users are very sensitive to this and it does exist. So the first few blocks there are a bit more blended than they should be towards the center of the screen. Whereas if you view the same blocks further out, the visibility improves. And this is often very difficult to capture on a video, I'm afraid, even on monitors which have more black crush than this. But if you view off angle, it sort of exaggerates the effect and it's a bit clearer what I'm talking about. So you can see the visibility of those blocks increasing from sharper viewing angles. And this does occur to some extent when you're just viewing the blocks further out, but it's a bit too subtle to really capture on the video. And I'll give you some examples in game as well. But as I said, as far as VA models go, the black crush on this is really quite slight. It's also worth mentioning that the gamma tuning on this monitor, it does average 2.2, but there is a little bit of a skew for the lower end, so that is for the very dark shades, and that's designed to alleviate this black crush a bit, so some of the darkest shades are actually a bit lighter than they should be. So the Legom test here on a monitor which tracks 2.2 closely, the first few blocks should be well blended with the background. They could be slightly visible, and if, if the monitor has strong enough contrast, but it's really, they're going to be quite blended compared to the other blocks. On this monitor, the black crush affects the visibility a bit, but the gamma is tuned to counteract that. At least that's the case on my unit um, using the test settings, which I explore in the written review. 
So that actually helps. It helps the visibility of these blocks. If anything, the first block is actually a little bit more visible than it should be, even accounting for the black crush. Although that does mean if you're observing this block further out, again, this is a bit of a subtle difference and it's too subtle to show you on the video, um, but the, the visibility does increase a little bit more than it should. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider. and I'm going to talk about contrast using some in-game examples. This uses a VA panel and VA panels, the contrast is often the main strength. And this monitor is no exception. The contrast is around 2100 to 1, the static contrast using my test settings. So that is somewhat below the 3000 to 1 specified for the panel. I didn't actually manage to get really very close to that using any settings on the monitor. So I think the 3000 to 1 is a bit optimistic or perhaps my unit's just a little bit worse than it should be. But having said that, it's still very much a VA-like performance. You don't get this kind of level of static contrast from a non-VA panel unless it has some very fancy local dimming technology. And what that means is for games like this, where there's plenty of dark elements, you've got dark interior spaces like this, it has a more atmospheric look than it does on non-VA panels. Now, I wouldn't generally advise, even on a monitor like this, viewing in a completely dark room with no lighting around the monitor or in your room because a 2000 to 1 or so static contrast really isn't high enough to give you an amazing inky look to things, the kind of depth you might get on, for example, an OLED screen. So you don't really get that kind of experience, even with a VA model. And there's certainly VA models with stronger static contrast than this. This is sort of on the lower end of what I'd expect from a VA panel, but again, still decent. As a VA panel, it does have what's called VA Glow, or what is commonly referred to as VA Glow. And that means that some shades are lightened up a bit more than they should, particularly towards the bottom of the screen from a normal viewing position and towards the bottom corners. You'll be able to see this on the video. And because I've got my camera mounted quite centrally at the moment, you can actually see it further up on the monitor as well. But in reality, the ergonomically correct viewing position would be a bit, a little bit higher up than that. So you tend to see it more towards the bottom rather than the top. It's also exaggerated on the video because the camera tends to capture that bloom of light more excessively than it actually appears in reality. But there's a moderate amount of VA glow on this monitor. It's nothing like what you'd see on an IPS type panel, especially the IPS ultra wides with the level of IPS glow you'd get in the same regions there. So it's very different to that, but it is a bit higher than on some VA models that I've seen. Not so much VA ultra wides, they tend to be quite similar to this, but just some VA panels more broadly have a little bit less glow than this. But even so, the overall atmosphere, I feel, is good. And again, not so much if you're sitting in a very dark room as I am now, but just in general when you're using the monitor, you do get a bit of extra depth to those darker shades. And the brighter shades, they stand out nicely against the darker surroundings. And because of the light matte screen surface with a fairly smooth finish, it doesn't have obtrusive levels of graininess. So the lighter shades don't have this kind of dirty, sandy look to them, which is nice to avoid. So Black Crush, it's something which affects some of the subtle details on, on this game, for example. So the shaded area here where my mouse cursor is, that appears very well masked. Everything's quite well blended together centrally, a little bit more than it should be. Whereas if you view it towards the edge of the screen, more detail is revealed. But this is really quite subtle, actually. The, the difference between the, the center and the edge so it might not appear in an obvious way on the video. But it is something which users who are sensitive to this kind of thing might notice. I don't really find it bothersome on this monitor because the level of black crush is really not extreme. As I mentioned, the, the gamma is set up such that the level of detail is actually a little bit higher than it would be if it was tracking 2.2 perfectly. And that's fine. That kind of counteracts some of this black crush. If you're considering compressed content, movie content on Netflix, for example, or YouTube. There are often compression artifacts, and these can give a kind of blocky appearance on monitors where the gamma's too low, or the perceived gamma's too low. So you get this to an extent towards the edge of the screen because of the fact that the perceived gamma's a little bit lower there. 
but really it's quite slight compared to the effect you'd get on monitors with clear problems with their gamma handling. And that would include TN models if you're looking lower down, where the perceived gamma is much lower. Things there will look quite blocky, quite banded if you like, with, with these compression artifacts. They're not as blended as they should be. And on some VA panels towards the edges, you get it to a much greater extent than this. Even on some VA panels that aren't as wide as this one, the viewing angle performance and colour consistency, gamma consistency on this one is really very good overall. And I'm going to talk about the colour reproduction of the monitor. And to start off, I like to use the Legom tests for viewing angles. That's my favourite website, legom.nl. So the Legom text that should appear a blended grey throughout, ideally. But this monitor it actually appears more blended centrally in a kind of large cone in the centre of the screen. And further out, it has more of a red hue. And that's due to some gamma shifts. So if you move the camera or you move your eyes, the cone that's more blended sort of follows you around. The bit that you're looking at directly is more blended. And bits further out appear less blended. And this is exaggerated if you're closer to the screen. Again, very difficult to get the camera to focus correctly here, but it sort of exaggerates the effect if you're close. If you're further out, as long as you're sitting fairly centrally, the effect is diminished considerably. So let's look at something a little bit more exciting, a little bit more relatable, solid colors. So the purple block, from a normal viewing position, this looks a fairly decent bluish purple in the centre of the screen and it quickly transitions to a kind of more pink hue further out, especially towards the edges of the screen, the side edges and the bottom from a normal viewing position. And again, if you are closer to the screen, this really exaggerates the effect. If you move around, it exaggerates the effect as well. The pink hue kind of follows you around. If you're sitting nice and centrally, a decent distance from the screen, not so pronounced. And actually, as far as VA models go, that the shifts I'm showing you here are not as pronounced as they are on quite a few other screens. The red block, that's even more consistent. The consistency is actually very good indeed for a VA panel on this shade, and it looks a nice rich red throughout. It does appear slightly pinkish towards the bottom of the screen and the edges from a normal viewing position. And again, if you're sitting closer to the screen, that is exaggerated. Further away, the effect diminishes. I tend to sit around 70 centimeters from the screen. So often in the review, when I reference various different things, I talk about black crush, blah, blah, blah. I talk about a normal viewing position. I'm talking about me sitting 70 centimeters or so from the screen and what I'd see there. Also with my head a little bit above the central line of the screen because that's the ergonomically correct viewing position. The green block that appears a good solid green throughout. There's really nothing of concern here in terms of the consistency. It also appears a slightly greener, a less yellow green, I should say, than it does on monitors with a less generous colour gamut, because as I'll explore shortly, the colour gamut does extend a bit beyond sRGB on this one, not to an extreme degree, but enough to give this a little bit less of a yellow hue, although it still looks a little bit yellower towards the extreme edges of the screen, but really it's pretty consistent for the panel type, to be honest. The blue block, a good consistent blue throughout, good deep royal blue. And I'm going to talk about the colour reproduction using some in-game examples, so a little bit more exciting to look at than Legom. Although Legom is very useful, in-game examples are also very useful. So there's a nice scene on Battlefield 5. I often use this scene, and that's because it has plenty of vibrant colours. It also has some good natural colours, a more muted palette of colours as well, all mixed together. And it's really good for separating out poor and good performers in terms of colour reproduction. So this monitor, it offers a pretty vibrant look to the image overall. As I'd alluded to just before, the colour gamut extends a little bit beyond sRGB. So content like this, it's a game, it's running in SDR, this monitor doesn't support HDR. Uh, so sRGB is the gamut that's targeted by the developers here, that's what they've got in mind when they're creating the game. And that means that if you've got a colour gamut that's wider than that, you get extra saturation. So the wood here on the rifle, for example, it has a little bit more of a sort of orange hue than it should, not quite as, as neutral as it should look. And some of the autumnal browns here have red hues which are a little bit too strong. But the extension beyond sRGB is not extreme on this monitor. It doesn't extend 
as far as DCI P3, for example, and it certainly doesn't extend as far as Adobe RGB in, in some regions and in the green region. So it does gives a little bit of a lick of extra vibrancy, if you like, and that's a kind of look that many users will like, but it doesn't make things look weird or cartoonish or unnatural. It's also worth noting that the extension color gamut gives you a very different look to what you get if you simply increase the digital saturation. For example, if you use NVIDIA's digital vibrance control or you use the saturation slider in the AMD graphics drivers, what that does is it pulls shades closer to the edge of the color gamut without expanding the color gamut itself. So that crushes shades together, you lose variety of shades, and things just don't look as distinct as they should. Things start to look very cartoonish. And also the most saturated shades, they're dictated by the color gamut itself. So if you're not expanding that, you're not actually gonna gain any extra saturation for the most saturated shades. A good example of this is the fires here. On this monitor, it just looks vibrant. It has nice rich reds, good oranges, some good yellow shades as well. Some of the yellow shades, yes, they look a little bit kind of too golden, a little bit too orange. In contrast, if you're using a digital saturation enhancement, you'll find that the most vibrant shades here, the reds there, they're not actually as vibrant because the color gamut hasn't been extended, whereas the oranges and yellows all get crushed together and you lose variety. So very different look here. And again, you can't appreciate this on the video, I'm afraid. It doesn't give an accurate representation of how things look, but it still allows me to talk through things and give you some examples. The environments here have a nice natural look to them. Again, a little bit more saturated than intended, but nothing extreme. So there's a good rich earthy brown look in places, some good autumnal colors and a nice range of colors as well. As I said with Legom, a little bit of saturation loss towards the edges. Things can look a little bit duller perhaps towards the edges of the screen and the bottom. But as far as the panel type goes, from a normal viewing position, and again, I'm talking about sitting around 70 centimeters, maybe 80 centimeters from the screen, perhaps a little bit closer, depending on posture, you still get decent consistency. So yes, you do lose a little bit of saturation, but nothing extreme. You won't even be able to pick this up on the video really, unless I get really close to some shades. So let's see if I can give you an example. So the grass here, it looks a little bit sort of more of a muted shade towards the edge than it does centrally, but really it's quite a subtle difference. If I unmount the camera though, and I get a little bit closer, this exaggerates the difference. So if you compare that to that, perhaps a better example would be the wood there, it looks less rich. But again, the consistency is really good for the panel type, especially considering the width. The curve does help a bit with that. I found a bit of a better example. The leaves here, just near my crosshair, compare the richness centrally to the edge of the screen. You can see towards the edge of the screen, they look more faded. They lose a bit of their vibrant look. And this is from a normal viewing position as well, as I described earlier. But really, when you're just playing the game, things do look vibrant overall. And really, the shifts compared to TN models, when you're looking lower down and the perceived gamma is much lower, and you compare that to higher up, where the perceived gamma is actually too high, higher up, even if it's perfect centrally, you don't get that kind of shift. Also, some VA models, quite a few VA models, actually show greater shifts horizontally than this model does. So the saturation shifts on this one are much less pronounced. But if you're comparing to IPS type panels, the consistency is not quite at the same level. So if you're doing color critical work and that kind of thing, where you really want shades to appear very consistent throughout the screen, IPS type panels are a better bet, even than strong VA performers like this one. But for general purpose use, and actually for some hobbyist color critical work, you can certainly use VA panels, and many users really quite like the overall look that they give anyway. I did also mention earlier that I would talk a little bit about the 21 by 9 aspect ratio when I'm in game and the benefits that that brings. I would definitely recommend checking out our article about the 3440 by 1440 experience and just the 21 by 9 aspect ratio more broadly. But essentially, most game titles, and that includes Battlefield 5 and also Tomb Raider I was playing before, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, they use a scaling method called HOR+, Horizontal+, 
And what that means is as your aspect ratio becomes wider, you gain more detail horizontally without losing anything vertically. So basically, if you think about a 27 inch screen, you just get less detail. You just get less of the game world shown. And on the 21 by nine screen, you just get extra detail at the sides, extra information at the sides, if you like, extra bits of your game world. So in other words, you have an expanded field of view. And it isn't the same as you'd get with adjusting the field of view in-game, using the in-game options. That tends to give you a strange fisheye effect. The zoom level of your character basically looks like it changes. Your view of the world just looks weird. It isn't like that. It really is very much like just having extra information at the sides of the screen. So that is something which can give a nice tactical advantage, if you like, a competitive advantage. For that reason, on some game titles, especially when you're playing multiplayer, quite competitive games, they sometimes don't allow you to actually use the 21 by 9 but in many cases they will, and there are just some examples of that. But 21 by 9 is nothing new now, there's lots of information out there all about the aspect ratio, the benefits, games that sport it well, games that don't sport it so well, and there's a bit of information on the article that I'd mentioned all about that and some utilities, some websites which can help you tune games. Sometimes you might find that HUD elements aren't aligned properly so they're too far into the center of the screen, even if the game world itself looks correct. But on the titles that I play, like Battlefield 5, the HUD elements are exactly where they should be. So everything works very nicely in 21 by 9. I'm now on Battlefield 5 and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor offers a 100Hz refresh rate and I've got the game running at 100 frames a second at the moment so I'm making the most out of the monitor in terms of the responsiveness. When it comes to monitor responsiveness there is an important concept to understand called perceived blur and there's an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness which covers this and explains that in a little bit of detail. And it's also summarized in the written review in the responsiveness section. But basically there are two key components to perceived blur. One of them is your eye movement as you track motion on the screen. And that is closely linked to the refresh rate itself and the frame rate of the content. So with the monitor outputting over one and a half times as much information every second as a 60 hertz monitor, or indeed this monitor running at 60 hertz, you get a reduction in perceived blur due to lower eye movement. And that does mean things look a bit sharper when you're moving your character around, when you're observing motion. The other aspect is pixel responsiveness. That is also important, especially on VA models like this, where there are always some weaknesses for certain transitions. And in this case, the weaknesses are reasonably widespread. Although I should mention again that this is not designed as a gaming monitor. And when Philips gave it to me, they wanted to make sure I made the viewers aware of that, that it isn't designed as a gaming monitor, so if there are some weaknesses that perhaps you might not expect from a gaming monitor, well that's because it's really being put out of its comfort zone. It's more designed for productivity, office use, and just general purpose use, that kind of thing. But anyway, I do like to game on monitors, and I do like to test them with gaming, so here I am. So if you compare it to one of the 100Hz ultrawides with the VA panel, which I have tested in the past, for example, the ASUS MX34Q, that offers a bit of a better pixel response performance overall. The weaknesses on this model are a bit more widespread, but I wouldn't say it's a dramatic difference. Both models do have weaknesses. It's just that on this monitor, the transitions I'm showing you here, they're mainly between lighter and medium shades. On the ASUS, they were actually quite fast. On this monitor, they are a little bit slower, so there's a bit of a, an increase in perceived blur, sort of a mask of perceived blur, just due to this powdery trailing in places. It's not extreme. You certainly still get some benefit from the 100Hz refresh rate. It's just that faster pixel responses would be helpful in reducing the overall perceived blur. There's also some standout weaknesses. These occur for the higher contrast transitions, so where there's very bright shades with much darker shades in the background, or very dark shades with lighter shades in the background. So for example, this text here where it says open range, this has a quite a pronounced powdery trail behind the white. It may not come across on the video, but certainly something you'll notice to the eye. And actually the box beneath that as well, it has just a sort of noticeable powdery look to it when you're moving. But it doesn't extend out, it's not like a smoky, smeary trail. 
Um, there are some examples of smeary trailing, and I'll get onto them shortly. But it isn't the kind of weaknesses that you get on some VA models where there's a sort of smoke-like trail all over the place, thankfully. And the darker shades up here, they show some what I'd describe as smeary trailing, really. More extended powdery trailing. Extends quite far beyond the object itself, behind the object. May not come across on the video again, but it is something that you can see to the eye. The monitor has different pixel overdrive settings called Smart Response. They're explored in the written review. I've just switched over to the fastest setting. I was using the faster setting before, faster rather than fastest. The fastest setting, I don't like that because these weaknesses I was talking about still remain. And again, the, the weaknesses for the, the lighter transitions and the medium shades. Perhaps there's a bit of a sp speed up in places, but there's also some overshoot, some quite noticeable overshoot inverse ghosting introduced in places with this setting. For example, the fringe between the wall and the sky in the background, there's halo trailing, so that's a trailing that's brighter than the object or the background colour. And it might not be captured on the video. And it's not particularly strong overshoot. This is perhaps isn't the best example. Um, I was trying to find some others in this scene, but just playing this game more generally, I did come across some quite obvious bright halo trailing and also some dirty trailing where the trailing, the overshoot is darker than the background or the foreground colour, the, the object or the background colour. So I don't like that setting and I don't really feel it brings much advantage. So I just use the faster setting. There are slower settings as well, but I'm not going to show you that because you're not going to appreciate the differences in the video. And I really don't think that anyone would like to use the off or fast setting when the faster is perfectly decent. It does introduce a little bit of overshoot in places, but really it's very slight overshoot. And I'll come on to that shortly. I'm now on a different scene, there are lots of high contrast transitions, lots of darker shades all over the place with lighter shades in the background. So there are some notable smeary transitions here around the, the post there, for example. I'll just get a little bit higher up, it might show it a bit more clearly. There's a definite extended trail behind the wood elements there. And it actually shows a bit of what I call breakup trailing. So this is whereby some of the shades in the background or the object colour appear to sort of leach out as if you're wetting a page with water soluble ink on it. So it's not just a sort of smooth transition between the background and the object colour and a mixture of those shades as most trailing would appear. You actually see some sort of blue elements as well and some, some red elements in places leach out in a more colourful way. Although the breakup trailing in general on this monitor isn't too bad, but there are certainly some slower pixel responses. You can see it around the flag post there as well. Definitely not the worst VA performer I've used, but not the best either. And if you do this strange circular motion near these canoes, it will look quite weird on the video. You'll see this obvious sort of displacement. It'll look kind of like a shimmery effect, perhaps. But that's actually some weaknesses in pixel responsiveness, again, showing the more smeary trailing. It's not, again, not, as ex it's again not extended and smoke-like, but you definitely see how it would increase perceived blur. And it certainly does increase perceived blur when you're using the monitor in person. And they're fairly widespread, actually, these weaker pixel responses. Um, compared to the ASUS I mentioned before, the MX34VQ, for example, they're more widespread than that. But again, to stress, this isn't a gaming monitor and it's really not what it's designed to do. But that isn't to say that you're going to hate gaming on this monitor. It does have a 100 hertz refresh rate, so you can do some gaming. And yes, there's, again, some of the slower than optimal pixel transitions here for the white blob there, giving it a nice little powdery trailing all around it, quite a heavy powdery trailing. But anyway, it's very subjective. Some users would find it just fine gaming on this, and for a bit of gaming on the side, if it's not your main use, I really wouldn't worry too much about this. Not everyone is sensitive to these weaknesses. And when it comes to gaming, 
Another aspect which this monitor has, another box that it ticks, if you like, is that the input lag isn't too high. I recorded around eight milliseconds, so it's not super low, but it certainly isn't particularly high, and actually most users would find this just fine. So it isn't gonna bother you with massive amount of latency or anything like that, or it shouldn't do. Another box ticked is the fact that it supports adaptive sync, so that means you can use AMD FreeSync if you've got a compatible GPU or system. It also means you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode as an NVIDIA user. I'm actually using an NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti at the moment. There's a little bit of a caveat, which I'll come on to shortly. There's a bit of flickering if you're using an NVIDIA system with NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, and, and that could bother some users. So I will talk about that shortly. But what the adaptive sync technology more generally does is that it allows the monitor's refresh rate to dynamically adjust to match the frame rate of the content where possible. And when I say where possible, that's because it has a 100 hertz ceiling of operation and a 48 hertz floor of operation. So if the game is running between 48 and 100 frames a second, Adaptive Sync does its thing. It gets rid of tearing and stuttering from mismatches between the frame rate and refresh rate. With the settings I'm using at the moment, I'm pretty much always at 100. There are a few dips below that, though. You might see it go to 99 every now and then. Even that kind of slight departure from frame rate and refresh rate, which you'd have if Adaptive Sync was disabled, that gives obvious tearing if you've got V-Sync disabled, or obvious stuttering if you've got V-Sync enabled. And I'm very sensitive to tearing and stuttering, so I really like having this out of the way. But I did mention flickering. There is flickering if you're using an NVIDIA G-Sync compatible GPU and you're using Adaptive Sync on this monitor. And the flickering occurs over a wide range. I don't find it too intense, to be honest, unless the frame rate's particularly low. So it's around perhaps 60 frames a second or even below that. It tends to become a bit bothersome and I'm not massively sensitive to flickering. So even to me, it's bothersome. But some users would find it noticeable even at higher frame rates. So say 80 to 100 frames a second and Adaptive Sync's doing its thing with the NVIDIA GPU. AMD FreeSync, that doesn't have that issue. I tested with my AMD GPU and there wasn't any obvious flickering that I observed in this way. So that's uh, certainly a difference to note between these two implementations on this monitor. I've now increased my graphics settings quite significantly and you can see that the frame rate is around 70 frames a second, but Adaptive Sync's doing its thing. It's get, getting rid of tearing and stuttering from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches because there aren't any now, and it works nicely. But again, there's a bit of flickering in places because I'm using an NVIDIA GPU. You don't get that flickering if you haven't got Adaptive Sync enabled. And to be honest, as I said, some users won't find it bothersome, but some users do find that kind of thing bothersome, so it is worth pointing out. Adaptive Sync, unlike G-Sync, and that is G-Sync monitors which have a proper G-Sync module, they use something called Variable Overdrive, and that means that the Pixel Overdrive is retuned across a broad range of different refresh rates. So as the refresh rate drops, the Pixel Overdrive slackens off, the voltage control is quite precise, and it reduces the voltage surges, and that means that you don't get stronger overshoot as the refresh rate drops because you don't need the same level of voltage for the pixel transitions, for the pixel overdrive, as you do at high refresh rate. But on adaptive sync models like this, they don't use variable overdrive. It just really uses the same kind of voltage you get at high refresh rates. I mean, the voltage does change a bit, but basically the, the pixel overdrive itself, the, the implementation doesn't really retune as your refresh rate changes. And that gives you an increase of overshoot However, using my preferred faster setting, this isn't a problem. There's a little bit of more noticeable halo trailing around the tree here, for example, but it really doesn't stand out in an obvious way. It's not brutal as it is on some adaptive sync monitors when the refresh rate drops. And that's the case even if it drops further to around 50 frames a second, which is near the floor of operation for the monitor. I've just switched over to the fastest setting just to show you. There is more overshoot. may not come out on the video because it's not super strong for these particular examples, but there is a lot of dirty trailing, actually quite not even dirty trailing. It's kind of a, a dark halo trailing almost around the light there. You'll be able to see that. So that's with this fastest setting. And that's actually, you'll see my frame rate is 99 frames a second at the moment. So this is an example of the stronger overshoot you'd get with this fastest setting even when the frame rate doesn't drop. 
So this is the kind of thing that you notice in places or I notice in places and I find it just extremely obnoxious and I'm pretty sure this will come out in the video even. It can be difficult to capture overshoot on videos but this will almost certainly come out because it's a really strong overshoot here. Back to my preferred setting, faster. You can see this again, actually. Um, it's not as strong, but it's still there, and it may come out on the video even. So this is an example of overshoot with the faster setting even. Quite, quite an isolated example. You don't really see this in many places, but it's just to show you that there is some overshoot on this model. I've now ramped up the graphics settings significantly, and you'll see that the frame rate counter, and that's in the top right, and that's in the game, it's not on the monitor itself, This is it's an in-game feature. It's around 40 frames a second, 40 to 45 frames a second. That's below the 48 hertz floor of operation for the monitor. But you don't get tearing and stuttering, and that's because the refresh rate is keeping to a multiple of the frame rate. It uses LFC or an LFC-like technology. LFC, low frame rate compensation, that's an AMD-specific term used to describe this kind of behavior. But if you're using the NVIDIA GPU as I am now, it does the same thing. The monitor uh, does keep to a multiple of the frame rate with its refresh rate. And if you go to the information section of the OSD, that's under setup information, you can see the listed refresh rate there is changing as the frame rate changes, but it doesn't match that, it actually doubles that. So that's what I was describing. This is the kind of behavior that you get below 48 frames a second. It's also worth mentioning that at the boundary where LFC activates or the LFC-like technology activates, there is a momentary stuttering or flickering of sorts. It's very brief, but it does occur when LFC kicks in or when it deactivates. So if you're frequently passing this boundary, so your game is sort of hovering around 48 frames a second, going a little bit below, a little bit above, that could be bothersome, but in general, it isn't really something you should notice too much. And in terms of the, the technology itself, it does work quite comfortably in this LFC window below 48 frames a second. To wrap up then, the monitor put the 3440 by 1440 ultra wide resolution to good use. That's certainly something which enhances the experience when you're gaming on desktops and movies where everything's set up properly. It gives you a nice amount of desktop real estate. And that's really what this monitor is all about. It's designed for productivity. And with that in mind, there are some nice little features that they added. USB-C, for example, that's not something that all monitors have, and it's something which can certainly be useful if you have a system which can use that, especially if you've got a portable device and you want to give it some power as well and that kind of thing. Another nice little feature was that motion sensor, which turns the screen off. I didn't really talk about this before, but it is talked about in the OSD video, and I show it in the OSD video. It just dims the screen and then shuts it off if nobody's using the monitor. So... If you go into another room, for example, it just saves a little bit of power. Then you come back and it very quickly comes back to life. It was very intuitive to use. It worked well in my testing of it. The screen has a 1500R curve. That's a moderate curvature. I've used this monitor for a few weeks, but it didn't take me long to get used to the curve. It just draws you into the experience a little bit. It doesn't make things look weird. It doesn't look unnatural. And it is exaggerated in videos and pictures of the monitor. The key strength of this monitor is a VA panel is contrast and it put in a good contrast performance overall. It wasn't the strongest VA model I've used in terms of contrast. It sat at around, I think it was 2100 to one with my test settings. So not super strong, but still beyond what non-VA panels achieve without any sort of fancy local dimming. And that gave a nice depth to things um, and certainly enhanced the atmosphere in darker scenes in movies and games compared to other LCD panel types. I found the screen surface quite agreeable as well. Light matte anti-glare with just a light misty graininess, the kind of graininess which, to be honest, most users won't even notice. It's really not obtrusive. As a VA panel, it does have some VA glow, a moderate amount of VA glow. I've seen some which have less, and I've seen some that have more. This is pretty much in line with what I've seen with most other ultra-wide Samsung SVA panels. This uses a Samsung SVA panel and it doesn't give you the same kind of atmosphere-breaking experience that IPS Glow can give you. Certainly if you look at ultra-wide screens of this kind of size and you look at the corners of IPS-type models, it tends to have an obvious bloom. On this model, it, it does have a little bit of a bloom. It's, an, it's a lot more subdued than IPS-type, though. There's also a bit of black crush, characteristic of VA panels, but about as little as I've actually seen on a VA panel, so not a major issue.
The colour reproduction was very pleasing overall for the panel type. Good consistency for the panel type. There are some losses of saturation towards the edge and the bottom of the screen. You get that in all VA models to some degree, and it's more pronounced if you're sitting closer to the monitor, less pronounced if you're sitting further away, as long as you're quite central. But the overall image remains quite vibrant, nice variety of shades, and the colour gamut as well extends a bit beyond sRGB, so it injects a little bit of extra vibrancy. If you like your image to look a little bit vibrant, but not with really heavy, intense oversaturation, then I think the kind of colour gamut they're using here will work quite nicely for you. But of course it's very subjective and there is some oversaturation. The wallpaper I'm looking at now, for example, I'm, I'm not sure how it appears on the, the video. And as I mentioned at the start of the review, what you see depends on my camera, your own screen, lots of other things. But when I'm looking at the preview on my camera versus what I'm seeing on the screen, there's a, a definite difference. There's actually a the sort of the, the oranges look quite overblown on the camera, whereas the reds don't look as intense as they actually do. So the image is very different. So if you've been watching this video thinking, oh, the colours look really weird, just be aware that they don't actually look like that in person. The monitor is not designed as a gaming monitor, but it's still worth focusing on responsiveness. Of course, that can be important beyond just gaming as well. But really, I, I feel as a, as a 100 hertz monitor, although it might not be marketed towards gamers, it certainly has a natural interest amongst the gaming community. So the responsiveness, the input lag is fairly low, not super low, but certainly not particularly high. Um, the pixel responses, there are some weaknesses, they're quite widespread weaknesses actually, and they do cause some issues. Some users will find this a bit bothersome, others won't really mind so much. Again, it's very subjective. It's far from the slowest VA model that I've used, but it's not the fastest either, and it's not the fastest 100 hertz VA ultra wide I've used. Adaptive Sync worked well as well, particularly as an AMD FreeSync user. And I say that because as an NVIDIA user, there was some flickering, quite widespread flickering over a broad range of refresh rates. This isn't something that's going to bother everyone. But again, it's not something I observed on my AMD system. So it is worth pointing out. And as an NVIDIA user, it's not something you observe if you have Adaptive Sync disabled. So overall, interesting monitor, some important boxes ticked, nice vibrant color output, Pretty strong contrast, reasonable responsiveness, not awful, not amazing in that respect. And a good selection of ports and really ticking the box for productivity quite well. And that's really what this is designed for. So that's really all there is to the Philips 346B1C. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.